Welcome to the Medical Muse podcast. Discover the humanistic aspects of physicians and scientists as they describe their career paths and any advice they have for current medical students. Each episode, we interview a new guest and discuss the future of the field. This is the Medical Muse. Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the show. We have Dr. Well Barsoom with us here today. Dr. Barsoom is the President and Chief Transformation Officer for Healthcare Outcomes Performance Company. Prior to joining Hopco last August, he was the CEO and President of Cleveland Clinic Florida. He is a practicing orthopedic surgeon, avid researcher and innovator, and a proven healthcare leader with a very successful track record, continuing to do very impressive work at Hopco. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Barsoom. Raj, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Welcome to the show, Dr. Barsoom. Um, so to begin, can you kind of tell us a little bit about yourself? Maybe where are you originally from? Great, happy to Daniel, thanks for asking. So uh, I was actually born in Jordan. Uh, my parents are Egyptian. And so I spent the first year of my life in Jordan and then the next couple of years of my life uh, in Egypt. And uh, when I was a little kid, my father who uh, was a physician ended up uh, matching for residency here in the United States. So he did a internship in uh, Oklahoma, and then did his anesthesia residency at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and then we spent most of our, our time in Cleveland. So I was kind of a homegrown Clevelander. Uh, and I, it's, it's interesting, I remember vividly the door that we would drop my father off uh, at so he could go for his residency training. Uh, and uh, we would drop him off in the morning and then the next evening go and pick him up. Uh, and you know, little did I know that I don't know, 25 years later, I'd be going in and out that same door for the next uh, uh, five years of my life during my training. Uh, so it's, it's been uh, it's been great. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, it's funny before we started the podcast, I was joking with you guys that the, that, that medical school and residency were the best years of my life. They, you know, it, it, it's amazing. I mean, it's just so much fun. And, and I have to say, uh, you know, being a healthcare provider, being a doctor, uh, I love every day of it. It's, it's, there's nothing funner that I can imagine. Dang, so from, from almost day one, you were able to be around one of the be best healthcare facilities in the world. That's, that's, that's lucky, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree with you. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic is a very, very special place. Uh, if you're really sick, it's an incredible place to be. Um, it, it truly cares about uh, their, their patients, their caregivers, uh, and uh, just to be surrounded by colleagues that are absolutely committed and great at what they do, there's, it, it's incredible. I mean, as I would walk through the halls, I would be amazed at, at the fact that I got to work there. Did your dad end up staying there after residency? He did. He stayed there for a few years, and then he went into private practice. So... Back then, the discrepancy between working in a place like the Cleveland Clinic and going into private practice and anesthesia was pretty significant. So uh, he uh, he ended up going into private practice and and had an incredible career actually uh, in Cleveland. Wow, that's incredible. Um, adding on to that, but before we uh, continue with this, um, I wanted to mention that we heard that you were a little bit into aviation. Do you mind kind of sharing? Some of that. <laughs> sure. Uh, so yeah, so about uh, 10, maybe 10, about 10 years ago. Yeah, it must have been right around 10. I think it was when I was turning 40 or 41. Um, my wife uh, uh, convinced one of my very good friends to give me a flight lesson. He owns an air ambulance company and uh, he's like a big brother to me. And, uh, and uh, I, he said that he would. So I went up with him in a little Cessna 172 and I was absolutely hooked. So um, he, he had used to own a uh, aviation school. So we made a deal with the flight school that I was gonna take my lessons at that he would actually uh, teach me. So this was a guy that had like 25,000 hours of experience. You know, it was a commercial pilot, owned an air ambulance company, fl flies jets for a living. And he would take me up in this little Cessna 172 and it took me about four weeks, actually, because I flew almost every day and I got my private pilot's license. Uh, then I went from that to a multi-engine and, uh, and I love flying. I, I, I fly whenever I can. That's amazing. Um, when I graduated college a couple years later, I had finally saved up, you know, a little bit of money 
I was going to either buy a pontoon boat because I lived in Austin where there's a beautiful lake and I figured I might as well utilize that or I was going to get my private license. So I too did the discovery flight and a 172 Cessna and it was so much fun flying around Austin, but ultimately uh, the amount of money I had could, I decided I would use it more if I did the pontoon boat. So that's still one of my goals to do in the future, <laughs> maybe after medical school is get that. Yeah, great. Pilot license. Well, that's great. Just be careful. That's the key. Always use your checklist. Same thing in healthcare. Always use your checklist. Right. So you were me you were mentioning how you had a lot of that early exposure to the Cleveland Clinic growing up. Uh, where in that process did you decide that medicine was for you and, and this is what you wanted to pursue? Yeah, you know, for me it was it was um, just being around it. I mean, my, my father obviously was always very proud of, of of what he did. You know, when you think about it, I mean, we were we all immigrated here from from another country. Uh, he found incredible success clinically and professionally uh, and personally in what he did. And, uh, you know, he was, he's a role model to me. So watching him and seeing the joy that it gave him, uh, it was pretty easy to want to do that. And, and it's kind of funny when I was younger, um, I would sometimes uh, pretend that I was sick so I could stay home from school. And then I'd go with my dad to the hospital and, and he'd bring me in the operating room and I'd watch surgery. So I remember being a little kid, this was before the days of laparoscopy and arthroscopy, but watching, you know, gallbladder removals and appendix removals and, and uh, C-sections and just thinking, man, what an amazing thing. Yeah, and, and I'm sure you guys know, right? I mean, you know, I, I think a portion of your class walks into their, into the operating room for their surgery rotations and they're immediately jazzed and think it's the greatest thing in the world. And another part of the class walks into an operating room and says, man, I can't wait until this rotation ends. And, and if you fall into the first category, it's, it's just exhilarating being in an operating room. And, and that I got to experience that for the first time. I think I was in the sixth grade and, and it never went away. Oh, wow. Those opportunities don't come by too often for the for sixth graders. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I still yeah, haven't been true. to an operating room. What's that? I still haven't made my way to the operating room. Oh, yet. is that right? Well, okay. it'll be fun for you to decide to see if you fall into the first category or the second. The good thing is we need all kinds of doctors, so it doesn't matter which one you fall into. But you know, hopefully, you get to match in in the field that you're really passionate about. Mm -hmm. So, why orthopedic surgery in particular? Yeah, so when I was a kid, um, and you, you'll hear this from a lot of orthopedic surgeons, I suspect, you know, I played a lot of sports. I, I played um, soccer, tennis, uh, lacrosse, uh, and I, you know, broke both wrists, broken ankle, you know, always kind of getting a little banged up here and there. And, uh, you know, my, my, our, our local orthopedic surgeons were awesome. Um, in fact, one of them, about 15 years ago, one of the guys that took care of me when I was a kid, I ended up doing his knee replacement and he did great. So uh, that was pretty nice <laughs> to see that he did well with that. But, you know, I, I looked up to these guys, they, they took a problem, they came up with a treatment plan and they solved the problem. And that was exciting to me. I, I like the kind of immediate gratification of orthopedic surgery. You, you, you have a, a problem, you plan for that problem, you execute on your plan, and you have a very real result that you can actually see, touch, feel, you know, and that to me is exciting. I, I find that exhilarating. So your, um, your father seems to be pretty um, amazing. He made his way to the United States from Jordan and Egypt. You said that seems pretty difficult. And then he made his way to the Cleveland Clinic. So he must have been a pretty strong leader. And now we look at the way you ended up, you ended up running these massive, amazing companies. Um, do you get some of your leadership skills from him? Yeah, I mean, I think I certainly do. You know, my dad's always been, uh, he's, he's a kind hearted person. He works well with people. He, he sees the good in people. Uh, but I'll tell you, um, as impressive as he is, my mom is even more impressive. My mom is, is the sweetest person who always finds the good in everybody. Uh, is, is one of the most uh, uh, non-judgmental people you could ever meet. Literally spends her days praying for her kids. I mean, she's just an incredible lady. So I, I, I attribute my success to my mom's prayers and my dad as a role model. And I think that the combination has been really great. 
Did you feel, so adding on to that, did you feel that you were inherently a leader or did you have to learn these types of qualities from your parents and other role models? And could you maybe weave that in into your journey of how you became a CEO of Cleveland Clinic Florida? Sure. So, you know, I guess when I think back, um, I went to an all boys prep school in Cleveland and uh, we, we had a hundred boys in the class and, and we had three rules, loyalty, responsibility, consideration. That's really what, what the school was driven on. It's called university school. Um, and it was a great school. I mean, really a great school. It really taught you how to be a man, not, not, you know, a kid. Um, and uh, when I ended up going to college, uh, I went to Case Western Reserve University. And amazingly enough, the second semester of my sophomore year, I was elected president of my fraternity. Uh, so I spent a year being president of my fraternity. During that year, we instituted, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, study hours where the fraternity had to be quiet for two hours of every evening. Uh, we had the highest GPA on campus. We won Greek week from a, you know, from a sports perspective. So we were a great house and we was terrific. And then when I finished being uh, president of my fraternity, which was halfway through my junior year, I ended up becoming president of the Interfraternity Congress. Um, and uh, so that was actually a great leadership opportunity for me. Um, so, so when I think back to my time in college at Case Western Reserve, I really got to apply many of the principles that I learned in high school. Uh, then I went off to medical school to uh, Ohio State. And while I was there, we actually had a very interesting relationship with the Cleveland Clinic, which was you could do your third and fourth year rotations there. Um, so I took advantage of that. And when we got to the Cleveland Clinic, they didn't really know what to do with us as medical students. So we kind of got treated almost as sub-interns from uh, as the be at the beginning of your third year. So I had an incredible experience with, you know, almost one-on-one -on -one supervision with with interns and doctors kind of looking after us, uh, making sure that we were doing the right thing and, and really giving us an incredible amount of training. Um, I ended up doing my residency there and then uh, my fellowship in Boston. And when I came back to the Cleveland Clinic, I, I really wanted to, to be academically involved. And, uh, and Joe Iannotti, who was the chairman of our department and really a, a mentor uh, to me, allowed me the opportunity to be academically involved. And uh, I, I participated in the residency program from an educational perspective. He gave me my very first funds to do my first clinical study uh, out of you know, some of the philanthropic funds that he had. And that really launched my career academically. Uh, and uh, a guy named Joe Hahn, who was the chief of staff at the Cleveland Clinic. Yeah, I think at the time he was the chief of surgery knew me from my high school days and um, kind of identified me as somebody that should go through the Cleveland Clinic leadership program uh, for surgery. So he put me through that program and, and kind of the deal was when you went through the program, you would get put into some type of a leadership role. Um, so uh, eventually ended up becoming the uh, vice chairman of the department and then chairman of surgical operations eventually. And uh, that ended up leading to me becoming CEO and president of Cleveland Clinic Florida. So it, it's, been, it's been a phenomenal experience for me. I mean, every step of the way has been, has been educational. Every step of the way I've, I've, I've enjoyed something new. I've met more people. Uh, and hopefully every step of the way I've influenced people in a positive way. That's what I really hope. But, uh, but it's, been, it's been an incredible experience. What was the transition like from being you know, very clinical or maybe educational to yeah. more administrative vision based for a large organization like that? Yeah, you know, th that's a good question. I've actually remained clinically active. So I still do hip and knee replacements. Um, it's, I think it's important. I think as a, you know, when, when you lead uh, an organization that is quote, a physician led organization, I think people wanna see that you're still a physician, that you're still actively taking care of patients that you're in the trenches. Um, so I, I never really stopped doing that. I would say that when I became uh, CEO of Cleveland Clinic Florida, I had to cut way, way back on my clinical practice for two reasons. Number one, most importantly, you've got to be available for your patients. And you know, if you're not available for your patients, then you're really doing them a disservice by operating on them. Um, the second part of the reason 
uh, is because I just had to focus on what we were doing at the Cleveland Clinic uh, here in Florida, which you know was a, a relatively small enterprise at the time that wasn't necessarily doing great financially. Uh, my job was to come down and help create a strategy for it, execute on that strategy. Uh, and we ended up doing, doing very well. So, I mean, when I came down here six years ago, uh, we were budgeted that year to lose about $14 million um, at Cleveland Clinic, Florida. The year I stepped down from being CEO, um, our EBITDA was a little over $100 million through our growth and our expansion. So it was really uh, an incredible experience working with wonderful people to see that kind of a change in an organization. In your past, um, yeah, well, I guess you, you moved here um, from Egypt and Jordan when you were quite young, but did you go back and visit ever or did you learn from other healthcare systems throughout the world to kind of help your experience as a leader um, throughout your career? Yeah, so I've done a few things. Uh, I do go back to Egypt frequently. In fact, I, I co-chair a uh, joint replacement program there. I take lots of my colleagues from from the states over there for the program. Obviously, we didn't go this year, but we were there last year and had an incredible time. I've, I've, I've had the course there about four times, and, and every time it keeps getting bigger and better. Um, so I am actively involved in that. Uh, I do a lot of work with uh, orthopedic industry. Striker is a company that I, that I do a fair amount of design work with, and that's actually given me the opportunity to really travel around the world, meet some of the most um, innovative, some of the brightest orthopedic surgeons around the world and, and share best practices and learn from each other. Um, so that was really, that's really been an incredible experience. And then obviously being a Cleveland Clinic surgeon, you frequently get invited to speak at conferences all around the world and, and being there and, and being a visiting professor at, at some of these uh, programs has been um, uh, just absolutely incredible. I mean, to, to meet folks and and learn what they do and share best practices back and forth and think about how we apply some of those things here in the United States, some of the principles around value-based care and, and uh, population health that many other countries have already fully adopted. Uh, and at the same time, teaching them some of the things that we're doing around cost management and OR efficiencies and things like that. So, so it's very much a two-way dialogue. So um, with all your experiences, uh, what, are, in your opinion, what, what are some of the key aspects that go into becoming a leader in medicine? And what are some of the challenges you have to face in creating a balance between optimizing patient care while making sure the hospital is functioning smoothly? Yeah. So I, I think the first thing, you know, in terms of being a leader is you need a true north. You need to know really where, where you want to go. And, and for me, true north as a healthcare leader today is value. It's quality, it's access, it's outcomes, uh, all divided by cost. And I think if you're focused on those things, you know, the patient experience and the quality that a, pa that, that a patient receives from their care at the very lowest cost possible, that to me is true north. So that's what I'm always kind of driving towards. Um, you know, on a personal basis, being a healthcare leader, you know, one of the things that's pretty evident to me is you gotta, you have to listen. You know, many times people come to you with an issue or a problem, um, and you may not agree with it. You may not necessarily agree with their perspective on it, but if you don't listen to them, they, you know, you've really done yourself and them a major disservice. So sitting back and listening to what people have to say, I think is really a key to being a good leader, not only in healthcare, uh, but, but really in anything that you do. I think that that's really the focus. And Again, I think this drive towards value is, is an absolute fundamental move that we have to make as, as a healthcare system, as a country. We just spend too much money on healthcare. And if we continue to spend 18%, 19%, 20% of our gross domestic product, eventually 30, 40%, you know, there's no money left to do other things. Where, where are we going to find the money to, to, to deal with homelessness? Where are we going to find the money? To deal with hunger, you know, there are so many things that we have to focus on um, that we're just not focusing on enough because of our spend in healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, so, to, to elaborate on what you were saying about listening um, and making that uh, listening well, making you a better leader, 
it's also a characteristic that's going to make you a better physician and also just your personal relationships and everything. So that's, I think that's some good advice for us to take in and, and really work on. Thank you. I appreciate that. So we know that um, in addition to being a leader uh, in healthcare, you, you've also been a tremendous innovator. Um, what does being an innovator in healthcare mean to you? And uh, what are some of your favorite projects that you were able to work on either at Cleveland Clinic or in your current role at Hopville? Sure. So, so I, I, when I think of innovation, um, and this is just Will Barsoom, right? I, I think about it in, in kind of two ways. I think about it with my orthopedic brain around implants and robotics and, and, and musculoskeletal technology. And, um, you know, one of the things that my, my uh, colleague, partner, mentor, Joe Iannotti, uh, and I have really focused a lot of our careers on is around how you place an implant in space, how you plan it and how you execute on that plan. And we have lots of patents and we've done several licenses around technology um, that utilizes CT scanning and creates three-dimensional models and, and, imp and then uh, helps create a model or a surgical plan for implantation and tools to execute on that plan. So, so that's been kind of a big focus. A lot of the work I've done with Stryker over the years has been designing better implants that, that, that ideally uh, help patients have the very best uh, motion and, and, and the, very, the most normalized kinematics in their hips and in their knees. Um, and doing that really through the most muscle sparing, uh, minimally invasive approaches that we can. So that's, that, that's one area of focus. The other area of focus for innovation for me is, is how we deliver healthcare, how we deliver quality, um, how we evolve from the classic fee-for-service model of healthcare to taking risk. You know, it, it's interesting when you think about what we do as doctors, there are very, very few things in the world where the decision maker bears no risk for the cost of the decision. I mean, think about that. Um, as an orthopedic surgeon, I might choose to use a $2,000 implant or I might choose to use an $11,000 implant, right? Nobody really comes to me and says, hey, well, why did you use that $11,000 implant, right? Uncle Sam doesn't call me and say, hey, you spent too much Medicare dollars on this implant. The hospital administrator doesn't call me unless you start doing it all the time, then, then you might get that phone call. But by and large, you, know, you order tests, you, you do whatever you want to do, and you, you really don't bear much responsibility for that. So by thinking about how we transition from this fee-for-service model more to a population uh, health model, it really does put more of the responsibility of the spend in healthcare on the decision maker, which by the way, is a good thing, right? I mean, you guys are, are pretty young. I suspect you don't have kids yet. I have three of them. If you don't put them on a budget, man, you can forget about it. I mean, all the money you you, you could make in a year will be spent in a week. Um, so, so, you know, I, I think it's just kind of a good habit to have to know how much money we're spending and actually have responsibility for what that spend is. I've always kind of thought once, once I learned a little bit more, um, like taking the science classes, I kind of realized that we need more innovation as far as new discoveries and things. But a lot of the things that, that are deadly to the most amount of people in this world, we have solutions to, it's more of an implement, implementation um, such as vaccines. We're witnessing it right now with COVID. Um, I, I, I think in the future, maybe we can see some exciting um, improvements in that and we can, we can help the, help the, some of the- Yeah, Daniel, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if you look at, at, at where we are with a COVID vaccine. I mean, that's really nothing short of absolutely spectacular. To, to have a viable vaccine 30 days after completing the genetic sequencing of a novel virus is absolutely amazing. I mean, it, it's just incredible. You know, the pace of change is incredible. Do you know that today, healthcare knowledge doubles every 72 days. I mean, just think about that statistic. You guys are sitting in medical school thinking, man, this is really hard. I got to learn all the glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and 
all these bones and the anatomy of the neck and all these complex areas of the body. But just think about that when you're finished and you're subspecialized and you're, and you're focused on your work every day. I can't keep up with all the journals that just talk about hip and knee replacement. But I mean, I, I, if I read every day, morning until night, I wouldn't be able to read, you know, the new articles that come out around just my little world of hip and knee replacement. So, you know, we have to be sensitive to the fact that the data and knowledge is increasing at such a rapid pace. We have to start thinking more and more of even things beyond something like a vaccine, which you can touch and feel. But how do we go to the next level? How do we start applying artificial intelligence? How do we start applying telehealth to be able to deliver healthcare across the world in a place where human beings don't have access to healthcare? 50% of the globe today does not have routine access to healthcare. How can we give it to them with a smartphone, with a computer, walking into a into a black box where you put your arm into a blood pressure cuff and a probe on your finger where it takes a drop of blood, tells you your hemoglobin, tells you your chemistries, tells you your blood pressure, uh, and, and, and maybe even eventually sequences your DNA and tells you you are at risk for diabetes, avoid sugar, avoid bread, avoid carbs, uh, exercise four times a week, right? Just that one little piece of information can change the lives of millions of people that don't have access to the most basic healthcare today. So technology, the technology boom in healthcare that we're going to see over the course of your generation without a doubt is going to be incredibly fascinating. That was a wonderful uh, answer. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, innovation and creativity come in many different ways and different personalities kind of um, are motivated in different ways to be, to be creative. And um, I guess my question is, how, how does one build that creativity with, with the patterns that you've come up with and the things that you've developed? Um, were you able to, like through experience and, and multiple procedures, have so much knowledge that naturally ideas started to spark? Or were you always naturally a creative person? And, you know, that is something that's kind of second nature to you. Um, I think that would be really helpful for our viewers who are interested in not just, you know, being physicians, but also wanting to create in their field. Yeah. You know, I've always been a tinkerer. Uh, when I was a little kid, I would take things apart and put them back together. You know, in my, if I had a problem with my bike, I would try to fix it myself. Um, I, I could either fix something really, really well, or I could completely break it beyond repair. Um, <laughs> it tended to be one extreme or the other. Fortunately, in orthopedic surgery, I can usually fix things really well. Um, I, I rarely break something beyond repair, thank God. Um, you know, I, I think one of the keys to, to innovation is innovate in what you know, right? I mean, if you were to tell me, hey, well, why don't you help us come up with a better insulin pump? You know, just to catch up to baseline where an endocrinologist is or a biomedical engineer that designed the last insulin pump is would take me years, right? I, I don't know that I'd be all that innovative in that area. It would take forever to catch up just to the basic knowledge. But if you tell me, hey, innovate a new acetabular component that has a better jumping distance to reduce the risk of dislocation, okay. You know, that happens to be an area where I've published a lot of papers. I have access to a robot to be able to do robotics, uh, kinematics research on. I already have a fair amount of background knowledge on. So yeah, I think, you know, if you give me a couple of weeks, I could probably come up with something pretty novel and, and pretty exciting. So, so I would tell you, um, if you have a desire, A, identify a problem, right? Don't just be like, well, here's just another solution to the same issue that there are already seven other solutions for. Identify a problem that needs solving and you happen to have some real expertise in it. And I think if you do that, you find that innovation is incredibly professionally and personally uh, satisfying. Do you incorporate um, a good team into innovation and also I'm sure leadership 
uh, throughout your career. What what exactly do you look for in a good team? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'll tell you, it, this is um, this is probably one of the most overused statements uh, that that you'll ever hear. But I love to surround myself with people that are smarter than me, and you know, a lot of people say that. The real question is, how often is that real? How often is that true, right? I'm sure you all see, you've both seen leaders who want to feel like they're the smartest person in the room. In fact, insist on being the smartest person in the room, even if they're not, right? That is somebody that's not gonna build a good team. I want to mooch off of everybody around me. If you're smarter than me, I want to suck as much knowledge as I can out of you. I want you to work as hard as you possibly can and are willing to work. I'll be there right alongside you. I won't go home while you're back in the office working. I'll be there with you, but let's do it together. Um, and I think you have to be appreciative of the hard work that, that people do. You, you've got to thank them for it. Yeah, I've, I've been very lucky in that. I've always been able to, to work with folks that are absolutely incredible incredible at what they do. And when I think back to, to, you know, my, when I first started um, some of the research work that I was doing at the Cleveland Clinic, Allison Klicka uh, was a research coordinator that was working in the Learner Research Institute. And I met her, somebody told me, oh, she's terrific. I talked to her. I said, look, this is my vision. I want to build one of the world's best hip and knee replacement research programs. Do you share that? Does that get you excited? And she said, yes, it gets me excited. We, Allison and I have now been working together for close to 20 years. She's amazing. Uh, I mean, she's an absolutely incredible person. Carlos Higuera was a resident that was, he was an intern actually, that was on the general surgery service rotating through the Cleveland Clinic. And he came and he talked to me, he said, hey, I understand that you do, that you're starting a research program here. I would like to do some research with you. I said, great, let's do some research together. He ended up matching in orthopedic surgery and training with us, going to the Rothman Institute to do a hip and knee replacement fellowship with my good friend, Jay Parvizi. We hired him back to the Cleveland Clinic uh, where we were partners together. And when I came here to Florida, I was able to recruit him to come down here and be the chair of orthopedics for us at the Cleveland Clinic in Weston. My chief operating officer that you guys may know, Ozzy Delgado, who is a pharmacist that trained at NOVA is an absolutely amazing guy and is one of the hardest working, most committed, most intelligent people that, that I've ever met. Um, Ashley Chaco, our chief of staff here. Uh, Ashley uh, uh, has a master's in healthcare administration. She sends me emails at four o'clock in the morning of an article that she just read about, you know, what Florida Blue is thinking about in terms of changes in payer strategy or how uh, um, uh, uh, Alan Miller and Mark Miller, who, who founded UHS, how they're thinking about behavioral health and taking care of the whole patient, or a podcast you know, from the CEO of, of Advent Health. You know, everybody's working hard. And when we get enough people, a great team, where everybody's doing things and distilling the most important information and sharing it with one another, then your time becomes more effective. You become a more effective leader, but most importantly, thank folks for what they do because every minute they spend with you, they're not spending with their families. Mm -hmm. It sounds kind of like um, one, you have to leave your ego at the door is kind of what you were saying in the beginning. And then two, it sounds like what you've done is you've sort of, it's almost like you've given the athlete their field to play on. You're, you're setting them up for success to help, to help the vision of everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's exactly right. And you do have to leave your ego at the door, but at the same time, everybody needs to know who the coach is, right? I mean, at some, there, there are points where you have to blow the whistle and say, time out, we need to regroup. Uh, but, but if you put the right people in place, everyone does their job. It's amazing. So how did you develop that self-awareness to being able to scout talent and then also know what your role is in that overall team approach? You know, it's interesting, you know, your role changes depending on the group that you're with. I mean, um, you know, when I was with the Cleveland Clinic, I was, I was the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic here in Florida, 
But when I would go to Cleveland, I wasn't the CEO, right? I was an orthopedic surgeon. I was the leader of part of the organization, but I had a boss, right, in Cleveland. Uh, so you have to play a little bit of a different role. Um, so, so I think one of the one of the um, uh, keys to success, especially in a large organization or a matrix reporting organization, is 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 figuring out how to be a productive member of the team, regardless of what your role is. You don't have to be the team leader to bring the greatest value to the team, right? And at the same time. Um, everybody on the team has the opportunity to bring great value to the team. So, so you, I think as a leader, you know, Daniel, to your point, you've got to be able to extract that from people. But at the same time as a leader, you also have to know when you need to take charge, when you need to see around corners, when you need to think about what's coming next and think a year, two years, five years, 10 years ahead and think big picture. So in different roles, you have to wear different hats. Makes sense. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And speaking of, uh, you know, your transition to Hopco, do you mind giving uh, our audience a little bit of how your roles were different between being CEO of Cleveland Clinic and your current role and how do you like your new role? And, you know, what are some of the exciting things that you're working on currently? Sure. And yeah. So as much as I, as I've loved, you know, the Cleveland Clinic. I don't know if you guys have read the book, The Inventor's Dilemma, but, but the idea behind The Inventor's Dilemma is that when you're really, really, really good, when you're top of the pile uh, at what you do, it's hard to disrupt yourself. Um, Nokia, you guys may not even remember Nokia, but Nokia used to be the market leader in cell phones. Um, Motorola used to be a market leader in cell phones. Um, Kodak used to be the market leader in photography, right? These are companies that you don't even hear about anymore when you buy a cell phone or when you take a picture. Uh, they didn't disrupt themselves. Uh, and, and I think what you end up seeing is smaller companies that kind of snuck up on them and did something amazing. Um, Apple is an example of that, right? I mean, Apple was trading at a dollar a share for years. I mean, look at where it is now after all the stock splits. I mean, if you bought Apple 20 years ago, you're crushing it today. Um, you know, innovation occurs when big organizations or when established norms are challenged. And it's hard for big organizations to challenge themselves and think beyond that. What I loved about Hopco was that Hopco was ahead of its time, but was clearly coming in to its peak season. Right? The idea of being able to take full global risk in the musculoskeletal spend and work with doctors and work with healthcare systems and work with payers to transform entire communities around population health managers for musculoskeletal care, which by the way, represents about 20% of the US spend in healthcare and happens to be something that I am really good at and know a lot about. So if you wanna innovate, innovate in what you know, it seemed like a natural fit. It was founded by one of my very best friends, a guy named David Joukowsky, also an orthopedic surgeon, trained at Mayo Clinic and Hopkins. And he had this incredible idea 15 years ago that was candidly ahead of its time. But he took that idea he built one of the most successful practices in the country, in fact, in the world for musculoskeletal care, high quality, high volume, um, partnered with a healthcare system, partnered with payers, and completely transformed the market. And now we're applying that all around the country. So that to me was exciting. I was ready to innovate and to disrupt. And that's what I feel like I'm doing today. And how long ago did you make the switch? August. So it hasn't been that long, but okay. I feel like we're already making a real difference. Yeah. So where do you see um, healthcare outcomes performance company going? Like what's your, what's your big vision, you know, years down the road with them. And then what's your personal vision within that company? Yeah. So, so a few things, I think, um, I think what's special about Hopco 
is the fact that um, it is, it's a physician led organization that has an incredible suite of tools and in essence, a blue ocean to work in, right? You're familiar with blue ocean versus red ocean, right? Blue ocean is where you don't have a lot of competition and you've got huge opportunity and red ocean is where all the sharks are. It's all the blood in the water, right? It's like, you know, that's like a commoditized product where you're just going to be competing based on cost. What I want to do is to compete based on innovation and to compete based on value and solve a real problem that exists today that doesn't have a solution. And that I think is exciting. So Hopco this year alone, we expect to grow by about 250%. Uh, we are moving at the speed of light. Uh, we're having a great time. Uh, we'll continue to grow, you know, whether the company ends up going public or just continues to grow, I can't say, uh, but, but I, what I can tell you is we're having a great time doing it. And most importantly, we're disrupting healthcare in a very positive way where we're bringing more value to more people and improving quality and reducing the, the cost of care. That to me is exciting. So this, this, this switch makes um, all of those things you talked about before a reality for you. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, listen, you gotta, if you're going to preach it, you gotta practice what you preach. Otherwise stop talking about it. I've spent a lot of time writing about value-based care. Now I'm getting to deliver value-based care and that's really exciting. What have some of the challenges with Hopgo uh, been for you thus far, even though it's, it's only been a couple months, I'm sure you've had plenty of them. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, it's always interesting when you, when you leave one organization and go to another, I was very lucky because I left a great organization and joined another great organization. So culturally, the organizations are both filled with people that are passionate about what they do, care about what they do. So that's been, that's really been wonderful uh, for me. Um, I really went from a world where I was running hospitals. Um, you know, today Hopco does run some hospitals. It runs musculoskeletal service lines across the country. It owns uh, specialty hospitals across the country and ASCs. But, but what I'm doing within Hopco isn't just that stuff, you know, with an incredible team, but it's also transforming the entire communities that we serve through alignment of physicians, through creation of clinically integrated networks, through working with, with, with payers. Um, so, you know, when, when you talk about the challenges, you know, one of the challenges sometimes is to get folks to understand the vision. It, it, it's a grand vision. I, and I understand that. I get the fact that it's a grand vision. I get the fact that to some degree, it requires a little bit of a leap of faith to say, we will take risk on a spend, uh, especially when you're used to just delivering a service and getting a check. Um, but it's, it's worth it. I mean, it's number one, um, it's the right thing to do for the community that you're in. Uh, it's the right thing to do for patients. And by the way, you can do very well financially doing the right thing. And I think that's, that's pretty exciting. There's nothing wrong with that from my perspective. Can you explain a little bit to us about what you guys do differently that delivers that extra value to the patient? Yeah. So, so I think it's a few things. So we'll have, we have several verticals, one vertical, will work with uh, musculoskeletal practices, pain management, podiatry, neurosurgical spine, uh, orthopedics, where we can actually manage uh, the practices through an, what we call an MSO. Um, there's usually a liquidity event for the practice where we buy some of their assets or maybe we buy um, into what we think their future synergies will, 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 will provide for them in terms of increased revenue. Uh, and then we, we help them with, with money, with management, with uh, skill set, um, and, uh, and tools to make them more successful. Uh, and we have a, a large kind of a foundational suite of software that is proprietary. We've created, it's been almost $100 million of investment to create this software to, to measure outcomes and to measure costs. We'll then work with hospitals where we'll manage large hospitals and large hospital systems service lines 
around musculoskeletal care. We don't manage their cardiac. We don't manage their endocrine. We don't manage, you know, their urology. We just focus on musculoskeletal care. We drive market share. We improve outcomes. We reduce cost. Uh, then we'll actually have some of our own facilities, whether they're ambulatory surgery centers or freestanding hospitals where we co-own or own on our own, manage together um, and drive uh, value there. And then finally, we have a medical economics arm that in essence takes risk where we get paid kind of almost like an insurance premium. And then as claims come in, the, ins the insurance premium through the insurer uh, actually pays the claim. And what's left at the end of the quarter is, is paid out as, a sh as what we call a shared savings. So um, are there any, so you've discussed a ton of challenges in healthcare that you've been able to overcome. Are there any particular failures or setbacks in your personal life uh, that you'd like to share with us that you think um, tremendously contributed to uh, where you are today? Yeah, you know, um, when I was uh, about 35, 36 years old, I was pretty young. I was only a few years out of my training. And I was at the Cleveland Clinic and uh, Joe Iannotti, who was uh, the department chair, uh, got a promotion and became the institute chair. So he led orthopedic surgery and rheumatology and physical therapy and some of rehab medicine. So that created a vacuum in the department of orthopedic surgery for a chair. Now, I was young. I was motivated. Um, I thought I could make a real difference. So I applied for the job. And I have to tell you, the search took forever. It was like eight months of, of interviews and searches. And I don't even remember, I think 20 people applied for the job. It was crazy. And uh, it came down to two of us. And I didn't get the job. Uh, one of my colleagues, who, who, by the way, is an incredible guy and, and was one of my professors when I was a resident, he ended up getting the job, Rick Parker. And he did a great job with it. I have to give him credit. Um, but, you know, like anything else, uh, when you don't get something that you applied for and, you know, when you're used to lots of success in life, that that's pretty disappointing. That was hard for me to take. I mean, it took me several months to to kind of get over the fact that, that I didn't get that job. Um, but as it turned out, it was great. I mean, I, honestly, you know, I tell you guys, my mom prays for me all the time. I think it was divine intervention. Uh, because what ended up happening was I ended up becoming the chairman of surgical operations, which was an incredible role. I ran surgery, uh, our surgical operations group for the entire Cleveland Clinic health system, which was 200 operating rooms, supply chain, uh, and included uh, management of nursing, of patient transport, of, of uh, quality in the operating rooms. I mean, it was an incredible operational experience. And probably more importantly, it was an incredible opportunity to learn how to lead um, through example, through influence, um, because you didn't have direct oversight of the doctors. So when you needed to see a change in behavior, you had to influence that change in behavior. So that was an incredibly educational experience for me. And that led to me becoming CEO of Cleveland Clinic Florida. So I'm not sure that all of those things would have happened to me had I become chairman of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Um, so in hindsight, that was you know something that didn't work out for me, but in the end, ended up being a blessing in disguise. Wow, that's incredible. Also, just going back to leadership because the question just came to me: uh, what's your what's your leadership style? I, th I think you know it's been interesting for us as students to see um, either different classmates or different positions. Um, lead with different emotions. Some people are more cutthroat and serious and like sports, right? Some people are more cutthroat and serious and they expect the best out of their teammates. You know, they expect them to be just as serious to get something done and others, you know, lead with a smile. They're very intense, but they lead with a smile and they're very encouraging and they push the right buttons in ways that make people feel positive about themselves. Yeah. You're coming off as a very optimistic person who, who kind of leans more that way, but I want you to share, you know, what's your style and yeah, I, it, it's it's certainly the latter. Um, I mean, I'm again, I'm a happy guy by nature. Uh, I love what I do, which makes it really easy uh, for me to be happy. Um, so, and I do believe in leading by influence and 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 through education. That being said, 
I am brutally competitive. I mean, I w I'm not sure that I would use the word cutthroat, but I hate to lose, hate to lose. Um, and uh, um, I will do, um, I mean, I will work my tail off. I will build the best team to absolutely positively deliver on what we say we're gonna do. And then I will go all in to get an account, you know, to get that account or to get that deal done uh, because it's great. I mean, it's exciting, it, 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 it's, it's motivating to me. And I love to see my partners, groups that, 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 that end up working with me winning. I love to see that. So um, yeah, so I'm kind of brutally competitive. <laughs> And adding on to that, like, what's your, um, like, what drives you every day? Has that driving, fa and has that driving factor been the same for so many years or has it changed? Has your inspiration changed as you trans transitioned into different roles? You know, I, I have three daughters um, and I want them to be proud of their dad. I want them to feel like, wow, my dad is really cool. He, he did something great. He's, he's successful at what he does. It's kind of interesting when I left the Cleveland Clinic, um, my, my, my youngest is only eight, so she didn't quite get it, but my two older daughters, so well, dad, what do you mean? You're not gonna be the CEO of Cleveland Clinic Florida anymore? I said, no, I'm taking a different job. Well, what do you mean you're taking a different job? You know, these girls were born in Cleveland Clinic hospitals, right? I mean, that's all they've known their entire lives. Um, so that was really, I mean, a, almost a bigger challenge and a bigger change for them than, than it was for me in, in many ways. Um, but again, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been really exciting for me and, and now they've gotten used to it. <laughs> they like having dad around more. Speaking of, speaking of family, how have you been able to manage that work-life balance and organize yeah. your family? You can tackle different projects, but then be there for your family. Yeah, no, I have to tell you, Raj, in, in hindsight, I probably didn't do a great job with that for the first, you know, 16 years of my oldest daughter's life. I mean, she's only 17 now. So it really wasn't until recently that I was able to dedicate a little bit more time. Um, even now though, I mean, I still, you know, I probably still work, I don't know, 70 hours a week. Uh, I used to work more. Um, I love my work. I mean, it's hard for me not to be immersed in it. Um, I, uh, I try to engage my kids in it as much as I can. Um, I can tell you, like, whenever we had a potential hurricane and I had to be in the hospital, I brought my wife and kids with me and our pets. I mean, they stayed with us in the hospital. Um, you know, I couldn't leave them alone and, and they would stay with me. And it's funny, if you talk to them, they remember these near miss hurricanes as some of the funnest times that they ever had. I mean, they thought it was great being in the hospital. Um, I've definitely gotten better at turning things off. So I'm not great at it. And I never really did it until recently. Um, again, I mean, when you, when you have patients depending on you or when you're running a hospital or a hospital system, you, you do need to be available to people. Um, so that was part of an active decision that I made to step away from the role that I was at. Uh, because I wanted to spend more time with family and I wanted to be there with them. So um, I would say that that's still a work in progress for me. I have a question for you. Um, so throughout this conversation, many times you've, you've mentioned mentors that you've had. Um, how do you, how do you find a mentor sort of, and how do you, how do you offer them something like you, you don't want to be the annoying kid who's or student who's asking them questions after questions, but not adding value to them. You want to be someone who they enjoy teaching and helping and, you know, they actually get value from doing that to you. So how do you um, go about finding a mentor, identifying a mentor, and then finding something to offer the people that you'd like to learn from and develop relationships with? Yeah, I think there's probably two keys to that. Number one, find somebody that wants to mentor. Not everybody has it in them. Not everybody really wants to do it. And, you know, finding a, um, a, a, I don't know what the word I'm looking for. You know, somebody that really isn't engaged in it and trying to convince them to do it. You're, you're not going to get what you want out of it and they're not going to enjoy it. That, that's number one. So if you want to find, if you want to be mentored, find somebody that has found success in what you want to do. 
that, that's my philosophy. Some people will tell you, find somebody that does, that does something that's nothing like what you do. You know, you want to be a great neurosurgeon, go find a musician to mentor you. They'll teach you about excellence and, the, and what it takes to, to be committed and to be great at something. Yeah, I mean, that's true. But wouldn't it be great if they could teach you that and teach you how to take out a glioma? I mean, it would seem to me that that kind of makes more sense. So, so if you can find somebody that kind of aligns with you and, and candidly, somebody that you look up to, like don't, don't be mentored by the chairman of orthopedic surgery at your hospital, who's not very nice and treats everybody terribly, but is world famous and is technically a great surgeon. That's not the person you want to be, right? Find the person that really exemplifies what you want to be. Uh, and, and ask that person to mentor you. And you'll find that by nature, it becomes a two-way street. You know, I, I enjoy this conversation with you guys. As you guys are asking me questions, I'm learning more things about myself. So I enjoy that. Uh, and I think if you find somebody that, 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 you know, to some degree represents what you want to be, you will find that it's personally satisfying for you and personally satisfying for them. That's a wonderful answer. Um... And uh, do you have any advice for medical students or residents um, regarding our careers or leadership that you wish you would have known anything that we should work on skill wise or anything at all? Yes, I do. I have one big piece of advice and nobody ever takes it, but I tell you, if you take it, you're going to be a lot happier. Enjoy the ride. You guys are already super successful. You have already accomplished more than 99% of the world can accomplish. And, and don't get cocky about it. You didn't just accomplish it because you're hardworking. You happen to be born in, in the right place to the right family, you know, to have the right upbringing, to have the right opportunities, to end up in an incredible place and you worked hard, right? So it, it, it's a combination of things. But as it turns out, things tend to work out pretty well. So enjoy your time, right? I mean, you go through life thinking, oh, what am I going to get? What, how am I going to score on my SATs and my ACT? Will I get into a good college? Oh, now I'm in a good college. How am I going to score on my MCAT? Will I get into medical school? Oh, now I got into medical school. How am I going to score on the USMLE? Am I going to get into the residency program that I want? As it turns out, there are a lot of paths that will bring people great joy. And it may not necessarily be the path that you expect it to take, but with the right attitude, you can make it a wonderful outcome. So enjoy your time. You will never be this age again. You will never have the health that you have today again. Believe me, I just turned 51. I know I'm on the back nine of life. So I'm trying to enjoy every minute of it. I wish I was your age in the position that you're in. So enjoy it. That's good advice. Uh, believe it or not, uh, medical school, the two years that we've been in it have been some of the funnest years thus far that I've had. So I think Raj and I probably are on the right path of taking that advice, but we have a lot of work to do still because, you know, the days before the test get brutal, but. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they do, but it'll work out. Yep. All right. right. Well, those were all my questions, Dan. Did you have anything else to add? Um, no, um, we seem to have asked them. I, I do appreciate you spending the time with us today. We had a, a blast talking to you. We learned a ton. Um, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you My so pleasure, much. Guys. My pleasure. It was, it's always nice talking to you. I wish you guys the very best. The Medical Muse is produced by Timothy Crow. Your hosts are Daniel Epstein and Raj Kavadi. Social media coordinator, Anja von der Austin. Music on the show by Foxy Music. For more information, check out foxymusic.com. Join us next episode where we talk pediatric emergency medicine with Dr. Yaron Ivan from Advent Health in Orlando, Florida. Lastly, we'd love to connect with you. Follow our Instagram, the underscore medical underscore muse, or on Twitter, at medicalmusepod. See you next time.